everyone, and welcome to Lecture 21, which will be on Rolle's Theorem and the Mean Value Theorem. So these are the two major results we're going to be covering in today's lecture, and I'll also do a number of examples that involve these two theorems. So let's first take a look at the Mean Value Theorem. So let me write down the statement for, for us to look at. So we're going to let f of x be a function which satisfies the following properties. So here are the two properties. So the first one is f of x is continuous on the closed interval um, I'll say on here, so this should say on. So it's continuous on the closed interval, a to b, and then 2, f of x is also differentiable on the open interval, a to b. So if you're dealing with a function and you check and these two things are true, then you get the following conclusion. So then, there is a number, and we'll call it x equal to c. So it's some x value in the interval, in the open interval a to b, such that the following thing is true. So f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. So what this is saying, and let me switch my color here. So what this is saying is the slope of the tangent line, that's what the derivative is over here. So the slope of the tangent line at x equals c, that is equal to, and this you should know as, from, as a slope formula, of the slope of the secant line. So this is the slope of the secant line between the two points a comma f of a and b comma f of b, f of b here, sorry. Let's just say f of b. So we've dealt with these two ideas before, the slope of the, the tangent line and the slope of the secant line when we looked at average rate of change versus instantaneous rate of change. So this one being the instantaneous rate of change, and this one being the average rate of change. Let me draw a picture so I can show you kind of graphically what's going on with this. So I'm just going to give myself the following picture. So we'll have a graph like this. This is going to be the xy plane here. And I'm just going to draw some kind of picture. If you're copying with me and you have notes, just draw something to this effect. It doesn't have to be super accurate, but do something like that on your paper as well. I'll say that um, this right here will be the x-coordinate a, and then this over here will be my x-coordinate b. So if I draw um, two points where I am on this graph here, so here's one right here. Here's another one right here. And we're going to call this graph f of x. So what you should notice about f of x is that it is continuous on a to b on the closed interval. And it is differentiable on the open interval a to b. And why is that? Well, it's because I drew it so. It's a nice graph, nice and smooth. Um, I didn't draw any kind of jumps or discontinuities or anything like that. So here is what the secant line looks like through these points. So I'll do my very best here. So it looks something like that. So this is my secant line. And now I'd like to draw a tangent line. So the tangent line I'm going to draw is I like to figure out where on this graph between a and b could I draw a tangent line so that the slope of the line I just drew is the same. And you kind of just have to eyeball this for a second. I need the line to be parallel to this. That's what it means to be same slope. 
And hmm, where would I say that this is going to be? Maybe somewhere right about here. So we're going to call this C. And at this special point C, if you draw the tangent line to the curve, just right here, and go like this, then you can see at the spot that I picked, the, the tangent line and the secant line have the same slope approximately. They're parallel to each other. So that's what this theorem is saying, is if you give me any two points on a function like this, draw the line through it, I can find another point somewhere between them where the tangent line, where it only touches the graph in one spot, is going to have the same slope. So the idea you need to take away from this is we can find an x equal to c where the slopes match. And that will always be true as long as you have a function that behaves just like this, that where these two things are true. OK, let's do an actual numerical example as well. So let's try this one. So my example is we're going to find the x equals c, which satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem. And from now on, I'll abbreviate it MVT. I don't know how many more times I'm going to use that. But we're going to find the actual x equals c value that satisfies the mean value theorem. Here's the function. It's f of x equals x cubed plus x plus 1. And they need to give you an interval. So we're going to say we're on 0 to 2. OK, so we're looking for some kind of c value between a equals 0 and b equals 2. That's going to get us a tangent line that matches this, the slope of this line, the secant line through these two points. OK, so the first thing you always need to check is you need to show that this is a continuous function, or at least state that it's continuous and state that it's differentiable. So I'm going to just make a statement right here. So because f of x is a polynomial, it is continuous and differentiable on and um, really on all real numbers. So this will be from inf negative infinity to positive infinity. So therefore, this function is going to satisfy the, the two hypotheses I need. OK. So therefore, I'm going to be able to find an f and um, f prime of c that equals the slope of the secant line. So let me do that. So I know then that f of 2 minus f of 0 over 2 minus 0 is going to be equal to f prime of c for some c in the interval 0 to 2. And that's this is by the mean value theorem. So I know that's going to be true. Let's go ahead and compute what this slope actually is going to be. So if I plug in 2 here, f of 2 is going to be 8. I'm going to use f of x up here. 8 plus 2 plus 1, that's 11. Minus what happens if you plug in 0 into this function, you get 1 over 2. So this equals 5 which will be equal to, and now I need f prime of c. So take the derivative of f of x and just plug in c. So what's the derivative? It's 3. Instead of x squared, I'm going to have c squared plus 1. So if you take the derivative of x, it's just 1. So we know this is true. 5 is going to be equal to 3c squared plus 1. If I rearrange that a little bit, I have 4 over 3 equals c squared. This tells me that c is equal to plus or minus the square root of 4 over 3. And then here, I can take the square root of 4, and this is just going to be plus or minus 2 over square root of 3. The problem is one of these numbers is in the interval, 
and one of these numbers is not in the interval, right? So which one's not in the interval? Let's go over here to where I have blank space. So over here, however, c equal to negative 2 over square root of 3 is not in the interval 0 to 2. Thus, c equals 2 over square root of 3. That is between 0 and 2. So that's the special c we need to satisfy um, the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So we found that c just like we found it right here using a graph. OK. Next, we're going to look at Rolle's theorem, and we'll do a couple of examples of that. So we'll see you in just a moment. Now that we've seen the mean value theorem, let's take a look at Rolle's theorem. It turns out this is just a special case of the mean value theorem, which is why it's going to explain mean value theorem first. So the situation you're looking at for Rolle's theorem is the following. It's very similar to what we had before. So let f of x be a function such that, and there are three conditions. The first, one, or the first two are the exact same, so there's nothing new to memorize. So the first condition is f of x is continuous on that closed interval. f of x is differentiable on the open interval. So together, these two right here are the assumptions of the mean value theorem, so nothing new. We're now adding on this extra special condition. So this is just for Rolle's theorem. I'll even start it here so that we're adding on just one more new thing. We need that f of a is equal to f of b. So we're talking about a function over some interval. So we're going to say that f of x is on the interval a to b. But now the new added condition is that a, f of a and f of b have to match. Um, so if all three of these things um, are met, if all three of the conditions are met, then there is an x value equal to c in the interval a to b, somewhere in there, such that the derivative at that special c is 0. Now, let's look at this two ways. So the first is graphically. So I have some nice differentiable continuous function. I'm going to pick two spots where the image matches here. So here, they're both the same height. So this is I'm going to call this x value a, and this is b. So here, my f of a is equal to my f of b. Let's take a look at the secant line through those two points. So you should notice the secant line is horizontal. So the secant line is horizontal. Um, that means that the slope is 0. So just like the mean value theorem, because we have these two conditions, the mean value theorem also applies. There's some special c value in here, it's going to be right here, where the tangent line slope matches the secant line slope, and it's going to be right there. And what's so special about this case is the slope is 0. That's why it's um, the special case. Is for Rolle's theorem, you always get that the derivative at the special c is 0. And then the second way to look at this now, I'm going to continue this. Mean value theorem said you have f of b minus f of a over b minus a equals the derivative at this c. But if you've imposed the special third condition, if these two endpoints the, the value of at these two endpoints are equal. What is this fraction over here equal to? Something minus itself is 0. So that's why this just becomes the derivative at c is 0. So that's two ways to look at this. OK, so commonly you're going to be given functions, and you're going to be asked if you can apply Rolle's theorem to them. So let's take a look. You need to be a detective. You need to keep all three of these conditions in mind. If any of the three conditions are not met, you cannot use Rolle's theorem. So you, need, you need to find anything that goes wrong. Let's take a look at the first one. So here you have a polynomial on a specified interval. So this is from A to B. Can we apply Rolle's theorem to it? Well, we know polynomials 
such as this one, are continuous and differentiable everywhere. So the first two conditions right here being continuous and differentiable, they're met. What we need to check is the third condition. So is this true? Do the function values actually match at the endpoints? So we're just going to have to check that for ourselves. f of 0 is 0 minus 0 plus 0 plus 5. So this is 5. What we're hoping for is when we plug in the other endpoint, when we plug in 2, we also get 5 because we need them to match. So if you plug in 2, I'm going to get 8 minus this piece would be 12 plus 4 plus 5. We just have to hope here I'm not going to mess up my mental math. Negative 4 plus 4 is 0 plus 5 is 5. So these two match. So this is yes. If all three of the conditions are met, you can apply Rolle's theorem. So somewhere in this interval, the derivative is going to be 0, somewhere between 0 and 2. Let's take a look at this. I'm going to take a slightly different approach here. So I'm going to graph what this looks like. Um, I called it g of x, and I just called it y. I'm going to go back to calling it g of x. What does the absolute value of x graph look like? Um, it's a v. looks like this. So we're looking for any kind of problems um, in the assumptions for this from negative 1 to 1. There is one problem with this. Uh, can you think what it is? It's actually right here. What can we not do at x equals 0? What can we not find out of those three things? Uh, it's the derivative, right? g of x is not differentiable at x equals 0. That's a problem, because x equals 0 is in our interval. And we need to be differentiable on negative 1 to 1. So we are not differentiable um, on, so on the interval, negative 1 to 1. So the answer here is no. We cannot apply Rolle's theorem because we violated the second assumption here. So this, this would not work. Um, we cannot apply Rolle's theorem to it. Let's take a look at the last one. So here, we have another polynomial again. So we have a polynomial, polynomial. <laughs> so conditions 1 and 2 are met. So I'm just using shorthand here. I'm calling them 1 and 2. You should probably say continuous and differential. We'll use those words. We're just going to check the third condition now. So this would be fine. We could use the mean value theorem on it. But now we're going to check we can use Rolle's theorem. So we're going to look at the endpoints here. Plug in 0 for this function, you get 1. And then we're going to plug in 1. That's my other endpoint. If I plug in 1, I get 1 minus 4 plus 1. That's 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So 1 does not equal negative 2. We cannot apply Rolle's theorem. Remember, you just need one, one of those conditions to fail. And the, this time, it was the third one that failed. So the answer is no. You could not apply Rolle's theorem to this function on this given interval. OK, I hope that helped clear up the difference between mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. Um, spoiler alert, there's not much of a difference at all. <laughs> um, Continuing on, we're going to look at some more examples applying the mean value theorem and Rolle's theorem. So I'll see you in just a moment. So now we'll apply the mean value theorem, and we'll look at these two examples. So the first one says, suppose f of x is continuous on the interval 2 to 6. f of 2 is 1. And f prime of x is greater than or equal to negative 3 for all x on the open interval 2 to 6. What is the smallest possible value for f6? OK, so we know a couple things here. We know that we are continuous on the closed interval. If I were to call this a and b, so 2 is a and 6 is b. And we also know that because this, we have this derivative here that's defined, 
we know that we're differentiable for all of these values as well, so on the open interval A to B. So what I'd like to do is I would like to apply the mean value theorem because we satisfy both, both of the hypotheses. So therefore, by the mean value theorem, so we can use this because we're continuous and differentiable, there is an x equal to c in the interval 2 to 6 such that we have the slope of the tangent line at c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. So that's just the, um, the conclusion of the mean value theorem. If I plug in now what a and b are, I'm going to get f prime of c is f of 6 minus f of 2 over 6 minus 2 is 4. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to rearrange this a little bit. So I'm first going to multiply by 4, and I'm going to add f of 2 over. So this is going to be f of 2 plus 4 times f prime of c, that's going to be equal to f of 6. Another thing I know is that f of 2 is given as 1. So instead of f of 2 here, I'll just plug in 1. So I'm going to have f of 6 equals 4 f prime of c, and then I'm just going to plug in 1 for this right here. So all I've done is I've switched the sides of things and I've made that 1. Now we know that f prime of c is going to be at least negative 3. So I can write this inequality, and I, I can say that this is going to be at least negative 3, if not larger. So this f prime of c is at least negative 3. I'm going to keep that the same. So then this right here, this quantity, is equal to negative 12 plus 1 is negative 11. So if I put this all together, this says that f of 6 is at least negative 11. So that's the smallest that f of 6 could be. And we use the fact that on this whole interval, for all the x in 2 to 6, f prime of x has to be at least negative 3. And remember, c is a value in 2 to 6 as well, by the mean value theorem. Okay, So there's that example. Let's shift gears to this one. So this says that we're going to show that f of x equals to x cubed minus 15, I believe that's supposed to be x there, yeah it is, 15x plus d is equal to 0, so d is just some constant, um, has at most one, <laughs> I'm just correcting all my typos, one root in the interval negative 2 to 2. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that we have more than one root. So Let's say f of x has more than one root in the interval negative 2 to 2. So I'm saying the opposite of what it's claiming here. It's saying that at most it has one root. I'm going to say, OK, let's say there's more than one. So f of x has at least two roots, because I'm saying there's, there's more than one. Let's call them x equal a and x equal b. Um, the important thing here, um, I'm going to say x1 equals a and x2 equals b. The important thing is that I'm going to say that they're, they're actually two different x values. So I'm going to say that these two are not the same. What does it mean to be a root of an equation? It means that if these two things are roots, then that means f of a equals 0, <laughs> excuse me, and f of b equals 0, since x1 equal to a and x2 equal to b are roots. Okay. So another thing is that f of x 
is a continuous and differentiable function on this interval, we can apply the mean value theorem to f of x since f of x is continuous on a to b and differentiable on a to b. So let's do that. So by the mean value theorem, we have that f prime of c is equal to f of a minus f of b over a minus b for some x equal to c in the interval um, a to b. And remember, I, I chose two different roots that are in the interval negative 2 to 2. So th that was a and that was b. However, because these are both equal to 0, so I have f of a equals 0, f of b equals 0, that means that this f prime of c equals 0 since f of a and f of b both are 0 because they're because a and b are roots. So that means the derivative has to be 0 somewhere. Okay, let's take the derivative of the function. So the original function, if I take the derivative, it's 3x squared minus 15. This is supposed to be 0 somewhere. So if I add 5 or 15 and I divide by 3, I get x squared equals 5. So this means that this c that I would have by the mean value theorem is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of 5. That's a problem, though. However, c is supposed to be in the interval Uh, negative 2 to, or, well, it's supposed to be in the interval from a to b. But negative root 5 is less than negative 2, and positive root 5 is greater than 2. And a and b were supposed to be in this interval from negative 2 to 2. So that's impossible. So let me go over here because I have a little bit more room. This is impossible. So the two c values we find can't be, um, are eligible because they're not in this interval from negative 2 to 2. So what we conclude then is f of x cannot have more than one root. So what happened was, this thing that I assumed in the beginning, this opposite thing, that f of x has more than one root, that was wrong in the first place. So um, in Mathemax, we call this a contradiction. We reached a contradiction. So I assumed um, the opposite was true. I ran with it. And then I realized, oh no, something impossible actually happened. So the conclusion is f of x cannot have more than one root. So at most, it has one root. Okay. Thank you for sticking with me with that. Uh, go ahead and try your lecture quiz. You should be more than prepared for that. And if you have any questions at all, just please reach out to me by email. Um, until next time, bye.